Okay, so we will come back to this uh, picture a bit later. We are discussing uh, quantum systems. Let me proceed with uh, a little bit of formal development, and then we will see some simple examples uh, before we hopefully see some quantum again today. I mean, quantum for the first time today. <clears throat> so, uh, the first thing I want to start is theorem stated by Poincaré. So old, proved a little bit later, I believe. Poincaré recurrence theorem. <clears throat> And this is stated in a rather broad context. It's certainly applicable for Hamiltonian systems, which is our, uh, uh, which is our uh, uh, subject of interest. So remember that we have a Hamiltonian flow on a phase space omega. And this induces a, a uh, transformation. That is, if you integrate the equations of motion, it takes every phase space point. Let me just collectively call that x. So x is the collection of all positions and all momenta, 2D dimensional vector. It takes this into some other point here. The flow takes it to some other point. <clears throat> so let us just keep that as a, a finite transformation. And let me today call that transformation t, as that's in my notes. And I'm going to look at it as if it's a discrete transformation but you can generalize it for uh, flows as well, I mean, for continuous transformation. So Tn <coughs> takes the point x and evolves it for time uh, n times and then gives you q at time n. If this is, uh, this is at time 0, then it gives you the positions and momenta at time n. So that is x prime which is t times x, and so on. So we iterate this thing, so there is an orbit in phase space, and we are interested in properties of this orbit. That's what dynamical systems is about, and that's what dynamics is all about. We're interested in that. Uh, so the Poincaré recurrence theorem, if you see in the literature, it is stated in terms of the following context. It's stated in terms of a phase space, so there is a point x, that belongs to this phase space. And also there is a transformation T, which takes points from this uh, phase space to itself. So it takes some omega into itself. <clears throat> so we can think of about it a bit abstractly. And also, in addition to this thing, it, uh, th there is, it, it is measure preserving. So we will think about it as uh, physicists that we are. And uh, uh, for us, measure will be simply some measure of volume in the appropriate. It could be some generalized volume or area or length, depending on the dimensionality of the space. But there is something, given any set A of the phase space, some subset A of the phase space of non-zero measure, that means it's not a point or a line or something on that, then we can find out how much volume is there in this. Let's just call it volume. Okay, so that's the measure of this uh, subset A. The map T is said to be measure preserving if this is true. So basically, it is preserving the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the measure as. A is transformed under this uh, uh, map T. So again, let's draw this uh, phase space. But now, with just this subset A in it, subset A contains, well, a collection of points uh, of that. So each of them gets mapped to some other point, and this gets distorted into something after this transformation T. So the measure is being preserved, is that the volume of this is being preserved as one goes by. As we saw yesterday, the maps that we were writing were, uh, measure pres were area preserving maps, so they all satisfy this constraint, this particular condition. 
okay? And in general, Hamiltonian systems are of this kind because there is a natural measure in phase space that is actually preserved. That's simply the volume of phase space, Liouville's theorem. Okay, so Liouville's theorem assures us that for Hamiltonian flows, there exists such a measure-preserving transformation. So that's, the, that's all that is needed of this. And Poincaré's recurrence theorem is then a statement of the following kind, uh, but let me just state it in English. It says that uh, if you if you were to take some point in this A, and if you keep iterating it, will it come back to A or not? That is the question. And Poincaré's recurrence theorem assures us that it will come back eventually. It will come back eventually, and not just once, but infinite number of times. So that's why it's a recurrence theorem. It keeps recurring. History repeats itself, and infinitely often. So that's the, uh, that's the recurrence theorem, and that doesn't put any conditions on A. A is some measurable, uh, finite, uh, finite measure subset of this, so it's not a point, but it's some volume. And the statement is more precisely that almost all points in A have this property that they will come back, and come back infinitely often. So, sorry, this, this T you mean, of this transformation? The only condition it has to satisfy is that there's a measure that is preserved, nothing else. There's nothing about integrability, all this is completely true for whether it's integrable, non-integrable, or anything like that. And in fact, it need not even be Hamiltonian, as long as it preserves this condition, this statement is true. So the almost all condition is a mathematical necessity which says that there are exceptional points, almost all. Exceptional points exist, so the, these exceptional points have a measure, you can find the volume of that, that should be zero. There could be infinite number of these exceptions, but their volume is uh, zero. So that's the statement. So let's try to formulate that. So and let's try to prove that. So let's. Uh, so this is standard proof. You'll find it in text or in Gordic theory or maybe in classical mechanics. It's a lovely book, old book by Arnold. All books by Arnold are beautiful, slightly hard to read, like poetry, but you have to keep at it. Arnold and Aves, ergodic problems in classical dynamics. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, I think it's 1967, so it's an old book. So, uh, let E be the set of points that belong to A and which are such that they return to A infinitely often. So, how do I say that? Dn belongs to A for infinitely many n. Okay, so that's the definition of the set, which returns to A infinitely often. And we'll define this other set, F, which is points that belong to A, points that belong to A, and which are such that they leave A eventually. That means that dn of x does not belong to A for n greater than or equal to 1. So they immediately leave the they immediately uh, leave the uh, 
uh, they immediately leave the uh, area A, the subset A. I haven't yet come to that. I will tell you what is the. It's at, at the moment, it's a statement of the theorem. It says that there are exceptional points and that they are of measure zero. We'll come to concrete examples. It's not just abstract stuff. Okay, so these are a set of points that will leave A and, uh, and, and, and never come back because for all n greater than or equal to 1, it does not uh, belong to A. So it leaves home never to return, wanders all over the complement of A. So that is the set F. No, they're not equivalent because uh, I'll, I'll, I'll actually tell you what is the connection between these two sets. Hmm? Uh, sorry? Huh? No, they, they, they can leave the set A. I'm not saying that E does not leave the set A. They will come back. And they'll come back infinitely often. They will leave again. It's not that they will be trapped in A after some time. F, they will never come back. It leaves after one iteration. So they are, it's a subset of A. So to begin with, it is in A. It leaves and never comes back. Yeah. It has to be a non-zero measure set. So measure of A should be larger than zero. Can be as small as 10 to the minus 100, but should not be zero. Okay, so so the you might think that A minus E, the set A minus E, looks like F, but it's not F. Huh? Yeah. So A minus F are the set of points that, uh, that can leave after finitely many, uh, many times, whereas F is something that will leave it immediately. So we'll see the connection between this, these two things. So it certainly contains F. Right? A minus E contains F because F leaves it after one iteration and does not uh, come back at all. So it does not belong to, uh, it uh, does not belong to E, but it certainly belongs to A. What are the other points that will belong to A minus E? So there are points which will do the following. So let's just go step by step. So we have the subset A, and uh, in, the, in that uh, subset, so let's actually, maybe we call this uh, whole thing A. So that's, that's our, our entire board is the omega, okay? And uh, F is some subset of this need not be such a nice subset, but let's say that it is some subset like that. And this leaves, after one iteration, it leaves A, and that's it, never comes back. So those points which will leave A after one iteration are an F, but those that will leave A after two iterations are not an F. What are those points that will leave a after two iterations. There are guaranteed to leave A after two iterations to never come back. So what you need to do is evolve F backward. The inverse F contains all points which on one iteration will be in F. So they will be in F. So they will belong to A and then they will leave after that and to never come back. Therefore, this contains points which will 
uh, leave A after two iterations. But first of all, to begin with, they have to be in A. Because it's A minus E. So it's, we should not include these kind of points here. So these points are the points which belong to A and which will A after two iterations for certain and never come back. So it's this union, P inverse F intersect A. These are points that will leave after two iterations, never come back. What about points that will uh, leave A after three iterations and never come back? P minus two. I don't know, uh, maybe this is not, yeah, T minus 2F. T minus 2F has an intersection with A, let's say that it has an intersection with A, and these are points which are in A, and which after two iterations will be in F. In between it could be elsewhere, we don't care. But after two iterations it's in F, so to begin with it's in A, after two iterations it's in F, which is a subset of A, and then it will go out, never to return. Sorry? Sorry? No, okay, I mean, we are considering maps, so there is no such uh, things. I mean, it's, could be, it's a continuous map, so nearby points will get mapped to nearby points, but uh, everything, so this entire A will be going to some other set, which could be intersecting itself, but it's not like it's a small transformation. Is that what you're asking? Okay, so that's it. So we got the stuff there, so we can write this out. It's a union of uh, T to the minus K, F intersect A. K zero to infinity. So you see that A minus E is not F, but it's this uh, infinite uh, set of uh, points. Okay, so now that we got this, what we need to show? We need to show that the measure of these points, the measure of points which are in A minus E, that is those points which don't have this property, that they will come back infinitely often, what should be the measure of them, according to Poincaré's theorem? Because that is the set. Zero. So we want to prove that actually the measure of this zero which is the measure of this infinite union, So this intersect of an intersection of a set with some other a set is a smaller set, and that's a, it's a union of that, so you can believe that this is smaller than or equal to the measure of the union of t to the minus k f. Because it's a smaller set. t intersect, uh, some uh, inter intersection of two sets is a smaller set than the set itself. Than, the, than either of the sets. So this is true. Now there is an interesting crucial point is that each of these sets T minus K F do not, are, uh, do not have an intersection, that is are distinct. For all k. Actually, it is like this picture. t to the minus 2f does not intersect with t to the minus 1f. And so on. f does not have an intersection with these. Again, fairly e easy to see. Let's assume that the contrary is true. So let's assume that there are uh, two sets, t to the minus n f and t to the minus mf, whose intersection is not null. 
and we have to show that this is not possible. So we assume this. And let's take without loss of generality that n is something which is larger than m. So, let's take a point y which belongs to this backward evolution of the set f by m times. Okay? What is t m y? Where does that belong? By definition, a backward evolution consists of all points which, when evaluated forward, will be in that set. So where will, what can you say about t raised to the m f? Uh, sorry, y. Belongs to? Huh? Belongs to f, for sure. So belongs to f. But also, we say that it's in the intersection of these two. Actually, I should have said that. So this belongs to the intersection of t to the minus n. Okay. So it belongs to the intersection, so certainly it belongs to t, in, uh, t minus mf, and therefore this is true. But on the other hand, it also has to be true that t raised to the ny should belong to f, because it belongs to this set. So what is the contradiction? Why is this not possible? Exactly. F contains all those points which on one iteration leaves to never come back. So this one here is t raised to the n minus m, t raised to m y. It's the same as that. So this is a point that belongs to f and so this, this, is, uh, this is a point that belongs to f and this is something which is uh, non-zero, some iteration, and therefore it's a contradiction. So it's not a measure zero thing. If there is not even a measure zero intersection. They are completely distinct. There's not even a single point which is common between these sets. Huh? As I said, just take it as volume. Like, you know, if I was to ask you, what is the area of this line? What would you say? Exactly. So measure zero as far as the area is concerned. But as far as if suppose your phase space is one-dimensional, it has some length. So like, sorry, just so a collection of points. And it, it could be an infinite collection of points and countable uh, infinity of points. But it could be having a measure zero set, countable infinity. Okay, so uh, where does that leave us? So this is an uh, this is an uh, infinite. Uh, uh, you, it's a, it's a union of infinite sets, which are distinct. So, what is this? So this uh, suppose this is a union of infinite sets that is that is distinct. Then this is uh, like a sum of the measure of t to the minus k. F. But they are distinct uh, uh, sets, and suppose they did not have a set of measure zero. Suppose F was not a set of measure zero, then what would be the uh, uh, what would be the problem? The problem would be that. Suppose this was something which was finitely measurable, finite measure, right? And also the measure of each of these things is equal. Notice that the measure of t to the minus k f is also the measure of f because it's a measure preserving thing. So the volumes of each of these sets is the same. You cannot have enough, okay, I should have said a very crucial point here. There's another condition in this, which is now stated here, that the measure of this phase space volume is not infinite, it's bounded. A crucial point. So that crucial point is now invoked. And if suppose they all have finite measure, so this, is, this will be then infinity, and uh, that's not possible. Because the 
finite union of distinct sets uh, which have finite measure is not an, an infinite union of uh, sets with finite measure is not possible in a bounded volume. You cannot have, uh, you know, uh, infinite number of idlis packed into one finite box. Right. So the what we have shown is that then each of these sets have a measure zero. So these these each of these sets have a measure zero, and it's an countable union of measure zero sets, which is uh, the, the, the measure of A minus E is a countable union of measure zero sets, which is, is itself a measure zero set. So what we have shown is then that uh, finally, that the set is a measure zero. So it's quite a remarkable theorem as far as the generality of this is, uh, uh, goes. So it's, it just assumes that you have a, but there's a crucial assumption too, so bounded phase space like an energy shell or something, you cannot have particles going off to infinity, like a scattering system, and you have some measure preserving transformation. So applies to all Hamiltonian systems, and in particular, this was used by uh, so it, it, it means that there is, you know, there is in phase space, as I said, this measure, this the, the set A can be arbitrarily small. So However small a set you may take, if you were to start a point from within that, it says almost all points in that set are such that they will wander probably all over phase space, but they will eventually come back into that set. Leave it, do further wandering, come back, and so on infinitely often. So it's a very strong recurrence property. So this was uh, used by Ceramello. I know they got the spelling right. Lodschmidt, to give a hard time to Ludwig Boltzmann concerning the Hedge theorem and the increase of entropy in a monotonic manner. Because this implies that, I mean, a, a, a state of a, 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 of a gas is also a point in some high dimensional phase space. And it's an isolated system, there's an evolution according to Hamiltonian dynamics, measure preserving, etc., it has to come back. So, the argument went that if you were to start with the state here, consisting of a gas which is confined to this small volume, and then the volume is removed, it has to wander around, it will, in our intuition tells us, it just fill this box or this room, but it will never come, go back there, thankfully, otherwise we'll be gasping for breath every once in a while. But Poincaré recurrence theorem says that this can happen, and not just once, but infinitely often. So the resolution of this kind of reversibility, which is there in this kind of uh, system, is essentially, and I'm not going to go into the details of that, the time it's going to take, obviously. One of the important points is this recurrence time. So the Poincaré recurrence time. So the time for recurrence, how large is that? And the general understanding is that this recurrence time is humongous, very large, and is typically some uh, number of degrees of freedom, or I mean actually uh, some uh, 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 a number of particles, if you have, uh, I think is at, at least exponential in that, uh, in, in that number. So it's usually much larger than the age of the universe. So the fact that it recurs is true, but it recurs after a very long time, and therefore we might not see it except in small systems. In small systems, and nowadays there are experiments being done on small systems, also quantum mechanics, and so you might see such recurrences and, uh, and possible quote-unquote violations of uh, second law. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, yeah. So, what are these exceptional points? So maybe we should look at some example, okay? So that's, I'm not going to talk much more about that, but yeah. Uh, suppose you have N particle system, like, like I was talking about a gas 
then it could be the number of particles, Avogadro number. That would determine the dimensionality of your phase space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, it's not infinity, it's actually zero. So maybe I should write here, this is zero. The, each of these things, suppose this was non-zero, that's the point. If it was non-zero, then it cannot uh, not intersect with... So you have an infinite collection of sets here. If they don't intersect and they have a finite measure, that's not possible when, the, when total measure is bounded. So they have to be zero. So this is zero less than or equal to zero. It has to be equal to zero. Measure is positive. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen, I would uh, encourage discussion a little bit later on these philosophical points. So, but I'll come back to this point about what is an exceptional point. Huh? So, so what do you think is an exceptional point? So let's take good old pendulum, right? Pendulum phase space. All right, so, uh, so let's take a pendulum phase space theta is this, and P theta is this, equilibrium point, stable equilibrium point, almost ellipsis, going around. Can you tell me where is an exceptional point? After all, here, it's a periodic motion. It's exactly periodic. So, I mean, we have actually some set A, in that, clearly it contains points which come back an infinite number of times. It's just periodic. It contains only periodic points. So every point in that will come back infinitely often. It's trivial. It's periodic. But there are exceptional... I can draw sets which are exceptional. So this is not one of them. Can you tell me a set which is exceptional? Ah. Uh, you mean, from your actions, you're talking about the unstable equilibrium point. Very good. So what happens? So if we take a set like this, A, so this is not a recurrent orbit. It's clearly something which is going to approach this fixed point after an infinite time. So it's an exceptional point. So in, in a higher dimensional system, like those chaotic systems which we're talking about, there will be many such, infinite number of such points. They, are, they could be called, uh, you know, things that are again approaching, uh, not equilibrium points, but actually higher order periodic points. They can be approaching those kind of periodic points uh, arbitrarily closely, and therefore they will never recur. Homoclinic orbits, they're called, or heteroclinic orbits, they will go to some other orbit and get stuck in that. So those are all exceptions. Why? It remains there forever. No, no, no. It doesn't include the unstable point. That's, uh, this is not an... Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this never leaves, so I mean, it's not an exceptional point. The points that leave here, for example, on the separatrix, if it is not on the separatrix, it will come back. Actually, not in this case, well, it will come back, it will go there. and It's got a higher energy, so it will, it will recur. Lower energy, it's part of a periodic orbit, it will recur. Here again, measure one, recurs. Poincare recurrentium cannot be violated, it's a theorem. So, but there are exceptional points of set measure zero, which is namely this arc length here it has area zero. They will never come back. Yeah? Okay. Sure. Uh, do you know what a separatrix is on a pendulum? No. Okay. Uh, if you were to think about it, 
in terms of energy, so I could ask this question. We have this pendulum. If you release it from here, you know what will happen. It will keep oscillating back and forth. If you release it from larger and larger angles, its period increases. Unfortunately, not fully realized. In, but it increases, and it increases to infinity as it is approaching this energy, this maximum energy of this uh, uh, unstable equilibrium point. So you could have a uh, pendulum which is here, with, but which has this energy of this uh, point. So suppose the energy here was zero, and this energy is MGL. Okay. So it could have, it could be at this point, but with this energy that corresponds to something like this, and let's say that its velocity was in this direction, so it will approach this point, but uh, it will take forever. It's in, uh, uh, because it cannot go to that point, because this is an equilibrium point, and no two orbits can intersect. And the equilibrium point will always remain. It's a reversible dynamics. It will remain where it is. Actually, exercise one or two was phase space pendulum in my notes, so I know that it's very hard with these uh, courses, but, yeah, but I assume that you would know some of that. Okay. So let's move on to uh, as something which is uh, uh, a mass of uh, a periodicity. Uh, there is periodicity, but the point is all of these are orbits are unstable. We'll do a concrete example, and then but before that, I have to just define two quantities or two concepts. Periodicity first. Again, let's talk a bit abstractly about the phase space omega transformation T and a measure of mu which is preserved under that flow, just as we have been doing for the point carry recurrence theorem. And uh, ergodicity is basically the statement that if you take two points, say x and y, let me write big, so x and y are two points, and let's say that we evolve x. Ergodicity is a statement that it comes arbitrarily close to this point y. So, uh, so if, again, this is true for almost all x. So for almost all x, there exists a time n greater than 0 such that if we iterate x n times, and find the distance between that and y, it's smaller than some fixed number, epsilon. You choose an epsilon, you can find an n such that this is true. So basically, it wanders all over the phase space. So almost all points wander all over the phase space. Again, exceptional points exist, like, for example, a periodic point will never move. Uh, I mean, uh, it will just go to other periodic points, or a fixed point will never move. So, we should just have in mind this picture that it's, some, it's something which is wandering all over phase space. So let's list, for convenience, let our phase space be one-dimensional. Let's let it be some interval, okay? Uh, here is an example of a famous example of such a transformation. There are several, so let me write one, four xn, one minus xn. That's a transformation of the interval zero one into itself, and it's a, it's got a stronger properties than ergodicity. But it means that if you take any initial point x zero, again almost every, any initial point, if you start from uh, x zero zero, it will just remain there. So if you take some other point, not zero, not one, take some arbitrary point, do some random number generator, pick a point, iterate it, get an orbit, x0, x1, x2, dot, dot, dot. The ergodicity says that if you mark any point on this interval y, 
and give some interval around it, uh, some epsilon interval around it, then this orbit, somewhere it lies in this. Yeah, but there's a region around it, so there's no exception. Why is, uh, it, it will come arbitrarily close to every point, including this point zero, which if you consider exceptional. Huh? No, it will come arbitrarily close to half as well. Oh, you mean the point half as your starting point? Yeah. So, there are many exceptional points. Infin there are infinity of exceptional points. And those are all periodic orbits or homoclinic orbits and uh, orbits connected to that kind. Okay, so anyways, so, but, but as a, uh, uh, since it's a course on uh, statistical physics, you should do some statistics with this. So what statistics can you do? So you're given an orbit, it's going to lie between 0 and 1, you would go and histogram, bin it, right? So you bin it, so that means that you would uh, divide this into many intervals and ask the fraction of times. So you run this orbit for some very long time, million. And out of those million points, you find out the fraction of points that lie in this interval. Okay? And every other interval. And what you will find is you find that it goes to a nice uh, distribution for large n. You can do this particular thing for this. So this is actually the measure which is being preserved under this transformation. If you were to start with a bunch of points on this interval with this measure, this measure is now not uniform, it is this uh, uh, thing here, then it will remain uniform, so there is this measure which is preserved under this. So this is how you can also get the invariant measure. Suppose you're just given uh, some transformation. In the Hamiltonian case, that could be the Liouville volume. Suppose your phase space density was uh, actually a full measure, I mean, in the 2D dimensional uh, phase space. is just the uniform measure, it's the Liouville uh, measure. But suppose you're given some arbitrary transformation like this. It's not clear what the measure is, and this is a way of constructing that. This is the fraction of points that lie in this interval. So it's some probability distribution. Uh, some probability distribution. So that's an invariant measure for this, uh, uh, for this transformation. Now there could be other measures which are invariant. For example, the fixed point here is just there. So you could have a measure which is just concentrated on that fixed point. That is also invariant because the fixed point is going nowhere. But it's not a smooth measure. There will exist all other kind of measures which are not smooth. So this is the only smooth measure which is invariant under this mapping. Okay, so ergodicity is... Uh, it, it, what I wanted to say was that the fact that it is filling these things and you can have such a measure, suppose we were to do a sum like this. We take any function, f, again, reasonably smooth, etc. And uh, it's a function of phase space. Let's call it xj. So it's the orbit. It's a function on the orbit. Okay, I calculate this orbit. Not necessary for this for anything. j is 1 to some time n and I divide by the time. Maybe I, since I start with zero in this example, I start from zero, okay? So this is a time average. This is a time average of this function f along this orbit. Ergodicity is equivalent statement that this is equal to integral of f of x with respect to this measure over the phase space omega this infinite. So this is Birkhoff ergodic theorem, stated without C 
So this is the statement of ergodicity that's often read, that the time average is a phase space average. That's the time average. That's the phase space average. Do you see why this is reasonable just from this example? Because how would you evaluate the sum? It's like a Riemann uh, uh, integral of this uh, sum. I mean, it's, it's, it's like just dividing, because we have this f of xj. It is now going to visit every neighborhood of this according to this, uh, actually, maybe I, in this p of x, maybe I should just call it mu of x. That's this measure. So the number, the fraction of time it's going to spend in x to x plus dx, the fraction of times that is going to spend in this is mu x dx. So then, this d mu x is mu x dx. If you wish. So this is. Uh, That's a probability distribution. So this is d mu of x. Okay, so that's the fraction of time that is going to spend in that uh, in that bin. Okay. So an ergodic system. There are several examples of ergodic systems. The simplest is all of these things which are periodic, like a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator is certainly ergodic. Ergodic, now first of all, we have to describe what is the phase space. The phase space is not the entire phase space here. It is only the accessible energy. So in any Hamiltonian system, since energy is conserved, the surface, the 2D minus 1 dimensional surface, the energy shell, is where the dynamics is restricted. If on this Oh, that is your omega. So if on this it wanders such that it comes arbitrarily close, almost all points come arbitrarily close to uh, every other point, it's ergodic. Yeah. Over what? One cycle. Uh, no, that will not necessarily cover the whole thing. That's only saying that it's going to come back to where it started. No, it's not going to go in circles. Get rid of your ideas of periodicity or circles. It's just, it's going to come back, but the recurrence times themselves have a distribution. It's not going to, if it comes back after 100 years, it's not going to come back after 200. You might have to wait longer or shorter. This itself is an interesting random process, Poincaré recurrence times, and people have studied how they are distributed and so on. Yeah. That's the... Uh, so what is, what is the meaning of the mu of x is that uh, the mu of x, uh, maybe I do an example. I do an example in a bit, and then you will see what that is. Okay. So in this particular example, this measure is, uh, uh, it's going from 0 to 1. So it's 1 over square root of x into 1 minus x. You can verify that maybe the normalization is pi or something like that. I forget that. But so in the in the case of a harmonic oscillator, every point is just recurrent to itself. It comes back to where it. it's clearly ergodic. It's going to come arbitrarily close to every other point. It's going to become that point because it's just passing through that shell. However, if you take a two-dimensional uh, oscillator, let's say omega squared x squared plus y squared. 
harmonic oscillator which is uncoupled, separable, then on the energy shell it's not anymore ergodic. On the full energy shell it's not ergodic because these individual energies are preserved. So it's lying on smaller subset, on smaller tori, and uh, it's not ergodic on the full energy shell, which is given like this, total energy shell. So another example, which is, a, which is also related to dynamics, but stated abstractly, it does not seem to be, is the circle map. So let's look at this and then... So this one here... is a map on the circle, so it's just angles. So we start with some angle theta zero. This tells us to rotate by this angle two pi alpha and get theta one, and then rotate again by the same angle to get theta two and so on. So it's just constant rotation. Modulo two pi is necessary because it's an angle. And it comes back. So what can you say about whether this is ergodic or not. Let's first take some example. Let's take that alpha is one half. Is it ergodic? Sorry. So alpha is one half. Theta, alpha is some parameter, some real parameter. Let's say it lies in the interval zero, one. So theta n plus one is then theta n plus pi modulo two pi. What happens to points under this map? It's rotated by 180 degrees and then 180 degrees again. Is it ergodic? No, because every point just comes back to itself after two iterations. So it's clearly not ergodic, it's not going to go anywhere. What about alpha is by one by four? Ergodic or not ergodic? Oh my god, it's rotation by 90 degrees. Um, it's period four, right? Every point is period four, thing does. So it's it, easy to see that if alpha is any rational number, it's going to come back after s iterations, winding the circle r times. So not ergodic. But if alpha is irrational, then it's an irrational rotation and it Actually, we can imagine that this is doing, but it's, the proof is not hard, but I won't do that here. That an irrational rotation is such that it comes arbitrarily close to any other point. It's, it will keep winding till it comes in some arbitrary interval of any point. Just a minute. And if you do such a distribution, find this distribution on this, it's actually, what, what can you guess about it? It's a distribution on the circle. It's uniform. Okay, there's, no, there's, no, there's no preferred angle in this. And uh, it's an, uh, it, it, it just covers the circle completely uniformly. Uh, yeah, then you should do it, if you think so. But actually, it's an interesting question, nevertheless. I'll uh, probably come back to it in a more general uh, case. Huh? I'll tell you why. I mean, why do you think it's interesting? Why do you think it's not Liouville measure? Yes, it can be, but why do you think it's not the Liouville measure? Because it's a... Uh, flow on phase space, Hamiltonian flow on phase space. But it's not the Liouville measure, it's slightly different because we said we are going to restrict ourselves on the energy shell. A Liouville measure is something which is on this entire phase space. So actually it's a good question, it is also true in general uh, of a Hamiltonian system. Go ahead and prove that the dq dp this is the phase space volume that is preserved under Liouville uh, phase space flow. But if you restrict yourself on an energy shell, the measure is not uniform on the energy shell that's preserved, but is actually this divided by uh, the gradient 
of the Hamiltonian. So that is the measure which is preserved on the energy shell. Yeah. What are the exceptional points here? No, no. Uh, alpha is just a parameter. The dynamical system or the phase space now consists of all angles on this. Alpha is just a parameter. In fact, here there are no exceptional points. Every point will keep, because there are no fixed points. It rotates everything. So in this case, the measure d mu of x is just dx. Or mu of x, if you wish, is the, uh, it's, the it's a uniform measure. Just the phase space volume that is preserved under Hamiltonian flow. Okay, so here, Birkhoff ergodic theorem in this case states that if you ask function f, you evaluate it on these angles which are being rotated, theta is 0 to n minus 1, 1 over n, you take limit as n goes to infinity. For any reasonable function, this should be equal to the integral f theta d theta 0 to pi, actually is 1 over 2 pi. It's a uniform measure on this. Prove this, I leave this as an exercise. And the hint is Fourier series. Write f of theta as sigma i k e to the i k theta, sum over k, minus infinity to infinity. Okay, so that's the hint. Prove that that's the case. So ergodicity is also there in systems which, uh, especially one-dimensional systems, they are not there typically in higher dimensional Hamiltonian systems, fail to be ergodic on the uh, energy shell. They may be ergodic in some lower dimensional uh, uh, surfaces, which are constrained by other constants of motion, but they are not ergodic on the energy shell. And in fact, you know the origin of the word ergodic, erg, it's a unit of energy, was thought of by Boltzmann as precisely this property of wandering on the energy shell, so that every, uh, almost all points, access every other point in some, uh, in some, uh, in some, uh, they come arbitrarily close to every other point in phase space. So, there is another concept, mixing. Mixing has this, uh, there's this, maybe I should, I could turn that on at this point, because there's a picture from Arnold and Alves. Yeah, so this is from the book Arnold and Alves, so he, they, they, uh, they start off by saying, let M be a shaker full of an incompressible fluid which consists of 20% rum and 80% Coca-Cola. Okay? The figure is this, in case you're interested. So that's the rum, and uh, the rest, I believe, is the Coca-Cola. Okay? And uh, uh, if A is a region originally occupied by the rum, then for any part of B of the shaker, the percentage of rum in B after N repetitions of the act of stirring is this. So the phi is what we have been writing as the transformation T. So it is the set A, that is the rum, taken forward by this mixing, stirring which you're doing, and how much it intersects from in some stationary region B. Okay, so that's the measure of rum in B after N steps. And this is a fraction of rum in B after N steps. 
what would you expect this to be after a long time, if there is truly mixing? Huh? It should be 20% of the volume of B. That much amount of uh, the, the fraction of uh, a fraction of uh, rum in B should also be 20%. In such a situation, physicists expect that after the liquid has been stirred sufficiently, often every part of B of the shaker will contain approximately 20% rum. So this leads to the following definition of mixing. That is that the measure of T to the... Okay, that's, that's my thing there. So that's mixing is by definition this measure of T to the N A intersect B. Again, this A and B are sets of non-zero measure, not just point. So T to the N A tends towards measure of A, measure of B, assuming that the measure of... Uh, phase space volume is 1. Otherwise, you divide by the phase space volume. As n goes to infinity, again, ink in uh, water example, mixing when you put it in there, there's no volume of ink is preserved. There's a, a measure preserving a transformation occurs, but you see that it's uniformly mixed throughout the water. So this process is a process which is called mixing. And mixing implies ergodicity, not the other way around. So mixing is a stronger property than ergodicity. And what it tells you is that if you were to start from some region A, it actually, and if you have some region B which is stationary and you're taking forward this A, it's really mixing in this sense. That the fraction of this in this, so it's, 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 it's doing this kind of an action, so that uh, uh, so that every other set B has some fraction of A systems in it after some time. Ergodicity is a smaller, is a is a more less uh, uh, violent thing, because if you start from a system A, it says that essentially it, it will have some intersection with B, but it need not mix all over the place. It need not be all in, in all places at the same time. It can just move kind of rigidly and then come here as well, and then move around. Like, for example, in the rotation map, nothing is mixing. Every arc is preserved. If you take any interval, every arc is preserved. So it can intersect some other arc, but it's not going to be in all arcs after some time. A transformation which is mixing but which is also ergodic, which is mixing on the interval 0, 1, is twice Xn modulo 1. This is a solvable model of chaos, so maybe I just discuss these things and then I, as usual, don't have time for quantum, but I should stop with uh, this unless, uh, I mean, my organizers are going to be really mad at this uh, performance. So, uh, so we, should, uh, uh, we should stop with... Uh, thing maybe but let us examine this twice xn modulo 1 map because you can understand everything that we have been talking about in this very elementary uh, looking example which is completely solvable so this modulo 1 implies uh, that everything is taking place in this 0 1 interval and what's happening, let's just look at it. So 0, 1, we are expanding by a factor of 2. So there is an expansion, 0, 2. And then there is this cutting. This modulo 1 action means that we take all the points to the right of 1 and we place them here. And this point is also here. You can imagine like a stretching of a rubber band and then pushing it back. So it's a 2 to 1 map two points get mapped to one, and uh, we are interested in the orbits of this. And the claim is that it has all these properties that I've been discussing about, including chaos and so on. So, simple to see that. Let's start with any point in zero. The key trick is that there's this uh, two there. We expand this in a binary representation. Zero point, A0, A1. So, all these A's are zero or one. 
what is x1? x1 is twice x0, so that is a0 plus a1 by 2, a2 by 2 squared, dot, 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 modulo 1. Now a0 is 0 or it's 1. In either case, if it is 0, it doesn't matter. This is already less than 1. a1 by 2, etc. is already less than 1. And therefore, it is just this. And if it is 1 plus something, it's larger than 1. I have to subtract 1. I have to subtract a0. So the x1 is a1 by 2, a2 by 2 squared dot. Or in binary, 0 0.82. Oh, what did I do? A0 is there. A1, A2, A3. Okay. And what is X2? Is X2 clear? Yeah? X2 is 0 0.82 a3, A4, and so on. So this is a dynamics which is called left shift for obvious reasons. It shifts all the binary digits to the left. A left shift dynamics. And, uh, and this map is ergodic, it is mixing, it is chaotic, so maybe we should explain first, maybe we should look at uh, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. I said that uh, we have a positive Lyapunov exponent is sensitively dependent on initial conditions. So if we take two initial conditions, x0, let's say 0 0.a0, a1 to ak, and uh, ak plus 1, k plus 2 dot dot, and some other point nearby it, x0 prime, which is almost close to x0. So it shares the first k bits of it, and then some other bits here. They are close to each other by about 2, two to the minus k, and k can be very large. If k is uh, uh, 20, it's like close to each other in a part in a million, and you cannot see a visual difference in these two points. Now, what will happen to this point after k iterations? xk. Uh, after one iteration, it's at uh, a1, so it's possibly at ak, ak plus 1, dot. dot. And xk prime is at 0 0.a1, uh, ak still, bk plus 1. So what can you say about xk and xk prime now? Where, where do they lie on the real line? Do they lie on the same side of 1 half? You go back to your binary representation, Thing. So 0, 1, 1 half, the most significant bit tells you whether you're on the left-hand side of half or the right-hand side of half. If it is 0, you're here. If it is 1, you're here. And the second significant bit tells you a similar thing here. If it is 0, then 0, 0, 0, 1, etc. So what can you say about this? You can say that they are on the same side, but that's about it. You can't say anything else. So they were initially close to each other by a part in a million, but after 20 time steps, that's it, 20 time steps, they have come to a situation where we don't know where they are, except that they are both on the same side of one half. And after one more iteration, we can't even say that, because that has gone away, and we don't know where they are in terms of this. So this is the, the something which was initially, uh, initially uh, very close, exponentially, exponentially actually becomes uh, uh, far away. So the exponential becomes clear just from delta x k plus 1 is twice delta x k. Any small variation in this, and so this delta x k, the variation is simply 2 to the k delta x 0. So 
any small uh, variation exponentially grows, and this is e to the k log 2. In this simple system, every quantity is log 2. That's Lyapunov exponent. So it's got sensitive dependence on initial conditions, but it's bound on this phase space. Now, I said that there are the a Poincare recurrence theorem also implies in some way that there are periodic orbits. Are there periodic orbits in this system? There are infinite number of periodic orbits, but of any given period, uh, let's say uh, t, there are only 2 to the power t periodic orbits, periodic points. So every point, let's say a0, a1 to a t minus 1, is a string, a t length binary string. You just repeat it, a t minus 1 dot dot dot. That point after t iterations, is going to be again itself. X0 is this, Xt is X0. Yeah. Yes, it is actually measure preserving. It's a good question. Uh, it's still a measure preserving transformation. It's not because you are saying that something here, you know, is, is going to become twice the length of uh, the thing. But go back to how the measure preserving is defined, is defined as an inverse transformation. Okay, the inverse is essential to make this, it is a measure preserving transformation, and the measure, invariant measure in this case, is also just the uniform measure. So the Uniform measure is uh, is in many. You'll have a slight problem if you try to do this uh, numerically, but you'll learn about computers if you try to do it numerically, and also some dynamics maybe, and how to overcome that. But this is a periodic orbit of period t. And since there are 2 to the power of t strings possible of this, there are 2 to the power of t possible periodic points of period t. And therefore, the number of periodic points or number of periodic points is actually of period t can include lower period, but of period t is uh, 2 power t. The number of periodic orbits is approximately going as 2 to the t by t because every periodic orbit contains t periodic points, t points. So this is also a general statement for systems which are, in this sense, uh, chaotic, that chaotic systems have number of periodic orbits of period t going as e to the h t divided by t. That's the number of periodic orbits. Period T. A H is called a topological entropy. So the topological entropy of this doubling map is also log 2, which is equal to the Lyapunov exponent. But in general, it's another number. It's called topological because you can make transformations of this map to some other uh, some other map using some smooth transformation, then the number of periodic orbits do not change. Where they are can change, but the number does not change. By the way, the first map that I wrote, 4xn into 1 minus xn, is the logistic map. And at this value of 4, this map is very closely allied in the sense of a transformation to the doubling map. 
And in fact, the Lyapunov exponents of these and the topological entropies of these are the same. Okay, so there's all a lot of dynamical systems, but maybe we don't need to go into more details of this. Um, I think I have the last five minutes. Um, there are two maps which are there in the uh, in the notes. Exceptional meaning in what sense? For the Poincaré recurrence theorem or what? Points that will not come back. Yeah, for example, all these periodic orbits are like that. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the points which approach the periodic orbits are of that kind. There is. So you could, you could look at orbits which will come arbitrarily close to this periodic orbit. Can you tell me a point which will come arbitrarily close to this periodic orbit? Any point which is such that you have some finite string here, and then you have periodic strings here of period t. Eventually, it's going to come, well, it's going to eventually, in this case, it's a slightly trivial thing. It's going to actually approach that point. It's going to go exactly into that. It's not a reversible transformation. And therefore, uh, there is this particular uh, thing that points become eventually periodic. Doesn't happen in a Hamiltonian system. So let me just draw a two-dimensional generalization of this map, which won't have that property. which goes under the name of the Baker's map, which takes this rectangle, uh, this square, so this is a square. It takes this rectangle into this, and this rectangle into this. So if you call this Q and this P, then Q has the same transformation. Q n plus 1 is twice Q n modulo 1. But P n plus 1 is P n plus 1 by 2. Now, uh, or let me write this as uh, let me write this as p n by two in two forms p n by two or p n plus one by two, depending on if q n is less than half or otherwise. Okay, I'm just saying that in in some this thing here, but you just have to stretch this by one by by, by a factor of two, compress this by a factor of half, and put this into this. So it's clearly an area-preserving transformation. And in terms of these kind of things, by the way, this sort of uh, thing is uh, a left shift is a symbolic dynamics. In this case, it's more than symbolic. You have, in the case of the Baker's map also, you have the, the same kind of a left shift. Now you have position and momentum, so you can have express in binary the position, let's say, q0, and the momentum bits, you put it this way. So the most significant bit of momentum is to the left here, b1, let me just call that a0 minus, a minus 1, a minus 2. So this is p0. Then you see that the Baker's map under this is still a left shift, so it's a1, a2, exactly because it's qn plus 1 is twice qn modulo 1. But the most significant bit which was lost in that map is not lost here. No information is lost. It becomes the most significant bit of momentum. Okay, so this is an area-preserving map and is more relevant to Hamiltonian systems. We will mention the quantization of such maps, but these maps also have very strong ergodic properties such as these, uh, ergodic mixing. And so let me, since there was some, since I have talked for two hours, or actually two lectures, and I've been mentioning this word, so chaos means that there is sensitive dependence on initial conditions. As in positively up and off exponent, we can take that as a condition. Two, 
it's got a dense set of periodic orbits. That means that arbitrarily close to any point, you can find periodic orbit. You can prove that just using the left shift for these things. Arbitrarily close to every point, you can find periodic orbits. So maybe part of your exercises. Three. Uh, three is essentially ergodicity. It's sometimes called in math literature transitivity. So this is sometimes called Divani's definition of chaos because in his book on introduction to dynamical systems, a very approachable book, he says that these are the criteria for a system to be chaotic. But actually it was shown a little bit later, I think 1991 by Banks et al. That any two of them imply the third. Any two of them imply the third. So it's an interesting uh, paper again, quite approachable with elementary uh, uh, analysis. So, chaos is not formless. There is this dense set of periodic orbits. It's made use of in semi classical mechanics as well as uh, mechanics itself. It's used in, to actually build averages and so on. And, uh, but it has strong uh, uh, properties which are. Uh, which are making it unstable. The sensitive dependence on initial conditions is making it unstable. Okay, so I just show this and then we depart. So because I I have to all with all these equations doesn't look good. So this is something is going to happen to do you know who this is, by the way? Huh? Who? Boltzmann? Point correct? Okay. Yes, it is point correct. Point correct recurrence time, point correct. Okay, so. It's not me. If you see my notes, I have somebody else on a similar picture which I have simulated. George W. Bush. So when I first wrote those notes, he was the Trump of the day. Okay? He didn't provide so much entertainment, but nevertheless, uh, so because I didn't want anything violent to happen to a cat. So it's called the cat map. Because in the, again, in the same book, Arnold and Aves, they introduced this uh, system, which is just a linear map here. And we all know how to solve the linear map. Complexity comes because it's actually of topology from a square into a torus. So you're putting modulo one on both sides. And the thing is, this has a trace of three. Unstable or stable? Unstable. Trace is greater than two. Uh, uh, greater than two. So it's unstable, but it's bounded. Bound to have chaos. Okay? It's also determinant one. So area preserving. It's a Hamiltonian kind of system. So let's see what happens. So this is the initial non-equilibrium density, if you wish, is Mr. Poincaré. Actually, it's coming full here, but it's not coming full there. Let me see if I lower the size. Is that full? No. Ah. Is that full now? Yeah. Okay, good. So we're going to apply the so you can think of this as the initial density, and then you're going to apply uh, the transformation once. And this is what happens to the picture. 
So is being dragged along the unstable direction. There are two equilib uh, th th there are two eigenvalues, two eigendirections, one with uh, eigenvalue larger than one. So it's being pulled along the direction, compressed along the direction, but it's an area-preserving transformation. So no information is lost. It's a reversible transformation. If you do a T inverse, it'll come back. Okay, but that's what's happened to Poincaré after one iteration. That's what happens after two iterations, after three, four, five. So there seems to be structures, and this is actually a very interesting system to study uh, analytically, but basically it's tending towards something which looks uniform. And if you had taken, I mean, you can't recognize Poincaré, if you had taken uh, uh, George W. Bush also, you would have seen the same kind of, uh, same kind of uh, picture. So as you go by, so it's getting mixed into the phase space, and every part of the phase space contains an equal amount of things. But there is some graining, so there is, there is a coarse graining in this. This is a simulation which I just found from Mathematica. So you see there are some approximate recurrences. It's not looking entirely uh, spread out or uniform, but that's because of the peculiarity of the Arnold cat map. And in fact, if we run this as a simulation, you will find that it comes back. So there is a Poincaré recurrence. Some people call this a Poincaré recurrence in the recurrence uh, in the uh, uh, in this map. But in, in this, essentially, uh, the the system does return. But my point is not that it returns. My point is that at this point, that it's simply that it's mixing, and it uh, and it leads to something which looks like an equilibrium. Whatever may be your initial state, it's it's going towards something which is mixed. You can see for more properties of this map in terms of recurrence and so on. It's a nice article by Dyson and Falk, American Mathematical Monthly. Somewhere in the 1990s, I think 1990. And it has to do with properties of Fibonacci sequences and number theory. And in fact, they use some probabilistic number theory to estimate the time at which it will come back. It depends on how large a grid you have taken for the image. So it depends on the size of the grid when it's going to come back. So there's also an exercise which asks one to ask you to find out or, or uh, ask you to find out how the distribution is tending towards. So you use the Liouville's theorem and show how this thing, is it really tending towards a uniform distribution or not? So uh, again, I leave that as an exercise. Uh, I thought I would do some quantum, but we didn't have time for that. So tomorrow, we'll start with quantum mechanics. Uh, please uh, read the notes. This wasn't meant. To, this was meant to be one lecture, but that's just me. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Notes are there already. Notes are there already. Uh, people have found it somewhere. <laughs>